Coming up on TechZilla Digital Projection, Rob's got a new projector review, IE9 and iPad 2 in the house. Help double bagging notebooks in a speed round of Twitter questions. So stir that pot and pour yourself a fresh bowl of lamb stew, because TechZilla starts now. This episode of TechZilla is made possible by GoToAssist Express. Support smarter with GoToAssist Express. The Ben Heck Show, building, modding, and electronics brought to you exclusively by Element 14. And West Host, offering premium web hosting since 1998. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to TechZilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Hey, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or, I don't know, maybe what the best home theater projector is, well, we've got an answer for you. And if we don't, well, in this case, we'll track down Robert, who <laughs> does have an answer for you. Shoot me a Twitter. <laughs> How much money do you have is the question. Always. Hey, IE9 is officially available everywhere. And while sadly it doesn't automatically wipe out installations of Internet Explorer 6 on other people's machines, it does promise better speed, which it backs up with a new JavaScript engine and hardware acceleration, a minimalist web design that gets out of the way of websites, more support for HTML5, and oh yeah, lots of downloads. Uh, Microsoft is saying they, that 2.35 million people in the first 24 hours have downloaded and tried out Internet Explorer 9. So. It's, it's a good sign. It's a good start. It is. I gotta say, uh, my favorite feature in IE9 it basically lets you drag tabs out of the browser window, just like other browsers now, like Chrome. I, uh, yeah, it, uh, <laughs> you know, it, uh, it, they also actually uh, pinning sites to the taskbar is kind of useful. Uh, the hardware acceleration is interesting. JavaScript compiles can be dropped in a second core, which makes for massive speed boosts over IE8. And there's hardware acceleration for graphics. Um, Case in point, running the Kung Fu game over at uh, ie.microsoft.com slash test drive on, say, Chrome. It was unplayable uh, on the same machine with IE9. Well, it's an, it's an MS demo, so <laughs> it worked great Go if ahead. I was running IE9. You can get IE9 at beautytheweb.com, which also offers links to a ton of sites that take advantage of HTML5. My favorite being, of course, uh, Fish, which is a fish tank. Uh, unfortunately, though, for XP users, IE9 is for Vista and Windows 7 only, so if you're on the XP, you'll be living on with the IE8 suck. Beautyoftheweb.com. Yeah. I love that website. <laughs> what Download. should we call it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the IE test drive side I get, but I, I can just totally see the marketing people at Microsoft going, how are we going to suggest that IE9 elevates web consumption to a higher level. And some of you are like, beautytheweb.com is available at godaddy.com. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know they were sitting there in a room. Oh. IE9 What's available? doesn't suck What's like available? IE8 did? No. Obfuscation is a good policy. Download it. Netflix, by the way, is moving in new directions. Original content, of all things. Deadline Hollywood says Netflix beat out HBO and AMC for a new series, House of Cards directed by David Fincher, starring our beloved Kevin Spacey. And the rumors are somewhere between 50 and $100 million for possibly two 26-episode seasons. But this is interesting, the idea that they beat out AMC, which brought us Mad Men, yeah. HBO, which has brought us almost everything I've watched uh, that, that isn't Buffy or Glee in the last three years. Um, interesting move for Netflix. We'll see. More content. Hey, I'm all for more content, especially getting series of TV shows that I can watch them just back to back. I hate waiting for that next week and end up just building up long lists oh, they're, of they're stuff to watch. They're going to make you and, wait. We, it's not like they're going to release 26 no. episodes of a new series they paid for. No, no, that day. I understand. But I'll, I'll wait the 26 <laughs> weeks and then, and then I'll go nuts for like a weekend and just glaze over. It's really hard to do that with a toddler in the house. Uh, that's true. <laughs> hey, in mildly related news, a startup named Zediva, I think I'm saying that right, uh, building kind of a competitor to Netflix, well, kinda. Instead of streaming movies, Zediva streams the output from DVD players, as in racks and racks of DVD players in a colo somewhere, stuffed with DVDs with the latest titles for $2 a rental. Now, the company plans on avoiding the studios altogether by purchasing retail copies of the movies. That means no blackout periods and access to all of the special features on the DVD. But we're not sure the giant rooms of DVD players with carousels to feed them are going to scale all that well. <laughs> and I do smell lawsuits. Technologizer has a good write-up, but sadly there are no pictures of the DVD carousels. Yeah, I want to see this crazy rack of DVD players with a carousel and a giant spindle of DVDs on it. Robotics. <laughs> Yeah, Redbox tried to get around uh, the studios by buying 
DVDs from retail outlets, and I just I just don't see this ending well yeah, for this company. I, I, wasn't this also tried with MP3s as well, where, oh, oh we, we'll host that disc for you somewhere. Well, in this case, they're not actually, and, it's kind of funny yeah. because they're not hosting the file, but they literally has a, have a physical copy of the disc, and I guess they can stream as, as many, they can, as long as they have a copy of the disc, they can stream the movie to someone. I, that's, that's, they'll, they'll figure somebody out. It's a little that. Rube Goldberg, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, I like you, the concept. You hit the play button in your browser, and somewhere a machine goes, Zzz. DVD resolution and then it waits for the tray to come out. DVD resolution is just about perfect for web delivery, though. Yeah. Especially with minimal. Have bandwidth. you seen Voodoo? Voodoo. 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 V-U-D-U, V-U-D-U as in 1080p streaming video. Yeah. With about yeah. four and a half, five megabit. That looks yeah. darn delicious. Yeah. If you were thinking about selling, say, your 64 gigabyte iPad right before the new iPad 2 announcement, <laughs> you should have sold it before the iPad 2 announcement. Gazelle's offer for my old iPad is now $393, down from over $500. I bring all that up because our favorite expert on games that are only available through download Byte Checkers, Anthony Carboni, is here in the studio with his new iPad 2. Hey Anthony, welcome to TechZilla. Oh, hey, thanks, man. Before we talk iPad, what games only available by download or through download are you currently obsessed with? Well, I just got back from GDC, you know, so I'm kind of obsessed with a lot of stuff that's upcoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, Phil Fish just released the new trailer for Fez today which is that amazing like 2D, 3D perspective bending cubist game that's coming out for XBLA, and I've been following that like crazy, and that's supposed to come out later on this year, so I'm just kind of like watching future developments right now, because there have been so many with PAX East and GDC, you know? So you're, you've, you've finally gotten over the whole Minecraft obsession? I have gotten over the Minecraft obsession a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. Although I did, I did get to meet the Minecraft guys finally and like shake their hands, so that kind of helped. Thank you. Yeah, I, just I, like, I really you missed so September because yeah. I was playing Minecraft. I didn't even know September went by. <laughs> so let's talk iPad 2. Sure. It's thinner, it's lighter. Did you buy the 3G or the Wi-Fi version? I bought a Wi-Fi version. Um, for me, the 3G just wasn't worth it because I've got a phone that can do the mobile hotspot. Right. Because uh, I run Android, so didn't really need it. How about the magnetic cover? The magnetic cover is is great. I mean, it's kind is, of would you point out the magnetic cover? No matter what you might have thought from the presentation, the fabulous magnetic cover that turns into a stand does the magic not come cover. with the iPad. Magic comes with a price, my friend. It's a forty forty dollars for the plastic magic and seventy dollars for the leather magic cover. Leather always more expensive. How's the performance been? It's been amazing. It's been amazing. Now I, I have to say that. I am kind of looking through kind of rose-colored glasses because I was not an iPad 1 owner. So you did not upgrade. I did not upgrade. You know, I, I've used the iPad a lot, the original one, but I was not an owner until now. So I'm just kind of in that magical device phase that... Look at it. I, I just have a window <sighs> under the internet in my lap wherever I go. It's like a magic mirror. It's actually, I gotta say, I, I downloaded more applications in the first month I owned my iPad than in the previous several years. Oh, dude, do you, do you wanna, it. like, I have a dollar count. I spent $165 this weekend on apps. <laughs> $165 on <laughs> apps, 40 bucks for the cover, like yeah. 600 bucks for the iPad. Yeah. This is starting to add up. Um, camera quality, I am, I am very disappointed with the still camera on this. It is not as good as the iPad 4's ca- or the iPhone 4's camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I brought it home, I definitely realized that. I do think on video, mm-hmm. there is a little bit more clarity, and I don't know if they're using a different lens or if, if a different, different sensor. sensor. Something is optimized more right. for video than for taking photos on this one. And, you know, I actually took a picture with this in a cab on the way home, and you kind of feel like a dork going like this out of a cab to take a picture on Instagram, you know? So I can see why they optimized for video on it. Are you gonna be, do you, do you think you're gonna be shooting any Bite Jacker episodes? Because it is, seven, technically it is 720p video. It is 720p video. I mean, it's like a high-end cell phone camera or right. a low-end pocket camera. So basically for one-third the price of the iPad, you can get a better video camera you can hold in one hand without yes. looking like a complete dork. 100% true, yes. I, you were actually, actually, and this is kind of a, a, a fail, I think. iMovie, not so hot. No, iMovie itself is hot. Okay. The, the app iMovie itself. iMovie good. Yeah, iMovie good. Importing footage into iMovie, bad. Because so, that's one of the things that you're going to get your, like your camera connector and mm-hmm. you're going to be able to import video and photos and So video. I shoot a lot of stuff on a DSLR. You know, a lot of people do. And I was thinking, oh, well, I can import clips from the DSLR mm-hmm. and cut them in iMovie iMovie is very specific about what you can import. It's got to be 264, and it's got to be uh, 720p 30. Not 60. Not 60, which a lot of like the later Canon cameras, which a lot of people use for video, mm-hmm. they're 720p 60. 
So you can tell they've definitely uh, optimized this for flip cams, pocket cams, consumer cameras, mm -hmm. you know? Digital, like still cameras, pocket point and shoots that have video on them. The three year old camera you've been carrying. Well, actually, no, the three year old camera you're carrying around probably doesn't do 720p at 30 frames per second. Exactly. And so, and thought. it's very specific about the 264 as well because I used a camera that has MP4, 720p, 30, and I was like, no dice. Is, is, are you too sort of flush with the glow of iPad ownership, or are there any features that are actually standing out, or anything other than the iMovie import fail? So games do look a lot better mm -hmm. on the two. Uh, a couple games that I that I downloaded that have specific iPad 2 upgrades were uh, Dead Space mm -hmm. and um, Infinity Blade, which if you compare them on the iPad 1 and the iPad 2, mm -hmm. it's a big difference. It's funny because they lock down the frame pad on iPad, the frame rate on iPad gaming, but they're basically allowing developers to throw more. Uh, better textures or, or better textures. Or better I film. think more effects. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they get because of because of the new video processors, they can probably push a few more polygons out mm -hmm. of it, um, and it looks great on the TV through the video mirroring too, which is kind of amazing. So I, I'm sensing, albeit the glow may fade, you are currently a big two thumbs up on this one. I'm a big two thumbs up on this one. Although, like I said, rose-colored glasses. If I had an iPad One. I don't know if I'd make the jump. <laughs> well, basically for 100% of the replacement cost. You actually replaced your notebook with this. Uh, over the weekend, yeah. I mean, unless I'm doing some hardcore video editing mm -hmm. or Photoshop or something like that, I didn't open my MacBook once over the weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, flush with the glow of iPad 2 ownership, Mr. Anthony Carboni. Bite Jacker is good stuff. You should check it out. Will you come back and, and do some more video games for Anytime us? you want. I like that thought. It's time to thank one of our sponsors, ladies and gentlemen, The Ben Heck Show. Join modding wizard Ben Heck and friends as they build and modify a host of amazing community-inspired creations. Be sure to watch the most recent episodes of The Ben Heck Show. This week, Ben's building the Xbox 360 portable laptop designed to look like a 1977 Atari system. Check out El Don't Laugh. This is serious oh, business, Anthony. It. This is serious gaming business. If you haven't been there, check out element14.com slash tbhs and enter to win one of Ben's most recent builds from the show, the Sega CDX Portable. The offer ends March 31st, so check it out today. Time to get our HD Nation on. And Gadget HD tweeted out, Samsung has announced the availability pricing for 2011 HD TVs, Blu-ray players, and home theater in a box. Pretty much the bulk of the lineup on the HD TV side, except the D7000 and D8000 hits the streets in March. If it didn't hit the streets in February, the 7000 and 8000 hit the streets in April, and everything we saw at CES 2011 should be out by May. Ooh, it's going to be a good summer. We have requested the 8000. Mm -hmm. We are we don't have an ETA yet for it, but it has been requested along with I want to say a 7000. We'll probably get the 7000 in first, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And da, 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 what else? The 8000 was pretty much the LED LCD flat panel of 2010. Yeah. Yeah. And the new D-Series is looking to be the one to beat as far as edge-lit mm -hmm. LED LCD televisions. We got an interesting, I got an interesting question from, from uh, somebody on, on Twitter, and they basically wanted to know how the tsunami was going to impact Samsung ship dates. Uh, for the most part, it should not impact them at all unless suppliers for Samsung were located in that region of Japan. Because Samsung's a Korean company. They do their glass in Korea. They do their assembly, almost all their assembly in Korea. Oh, Is no, any done that, in China? China? The assembly takes place around the world, okay. depending on what. Like for North America here, it's all done in Mexico no and then it. shipped up to us. Uh, most of the main components are manufactured there in Korea, though. Okay. So. If there's a Japanese assembly facility, that's probably, probably dramatically probably impacted. scaled back at the moment. But they the are a, a global company, and their glass pretty much comes from Korea. So Good deal. Hey, I have a giant projector sitting on the get, floor get, there. Get, I'm going to go get, get it. it. <laughs> this is Digital Projections <laughs> M-Vision Cine 230. Yeah. Basically, this is what the... the, the one of the only high-end projectors we've ever shown Comes off because it's one of the cable. only high-end projectors out for under ten thousand dollars. It is really, really nice. And this is a sub seven thousand dollar front projector. That's what it is. And basically, you start spending this kind of money on a projector to not just get the giant screen, but to get amazing blacks and colors. Did we get Truly. the amazing blacks and colors? Color is what this baby does better than a lot of projectors I've seen right out of the box. Mm -hmm. Now this is using a single chip system. That means there's one DLP chip that's uh, basically a micro mirror device developed by Texas Instrument. Mm -hmm. it uses millions of little micro mirrors to basically drive each pixel on the screen. The light shines onto that chip. Mm -hmm. Each little mirror creates that pixel. That light's actually put through, it's, it's white light essentially, and it's put through a six segment color wheel. Red, blue, green, red, blue, green. And as that wheel spins, that actually generates the color. And as the chip does its magic, 
that all gets put together on the screen as such. Now, there are several lens options available for this. Oh, wanna, this is the same technology used in my $650 refurbished Optoma HD 180. It is indeed. What do you get for the 10x increase in price? A couple things. Outside well, of a new, not refurbished projector. Definitely more light output. You have a larger lamp system in this. Also, the lens. This is probably where the majority of the money is going to go, and the internal electronics as well. This particular version is equipped with a, what they call a 185 to a 240 to 1 zoom lens, which is pretty nice. It gives you a good amount of screen size adjustment depending on where you put it. It also features what I, I love, I've come to love, is actually horizontal and vertical lens shift. You actually remove this top panel here and you can drop in this included little wrench to adjust the image coming out of the projector, either left or right, usually about 50% of the image, you can shift it left or right without having to move the projector, or about almost 100% up and down. Not why, would, why would I want to do that? For easier installation, maybe you have a spot set up that you want to put the projector, yet it, in order to say, when it's aimed at the screen, maybe in the ideal spot for the projector, it's hitting the screen, only half of the screen is right. actually being lit up. And you need to move that image down without sacrificing the picture quality. Mm -hmm. Now, on a lot of systems, you could just tilt the whole projector forward, but that, you don't want to change the... Well, when you tilt the, the projector forward, if you can't move the lens, then you have to do keystoning adjustment inside Which you the never want to touch digital keystone correction if you do, because the minute you even enable the slightest bit of it, you've cut at least half the resolution of the picture. Digital keystone correction is terrible. Anyway, avoid that. This has <laughs> manual lens shifting, so it's not automatic. You can't just do it with a remote control. You actually have to pop the top off and do it. That's typically something you only have to do once, so... I find it extremely handy to be able to set it and forget it. Now, we were shooting the SIN 230 onto a 92-inch screen, and given this lens setup that gives us basically with a 92-inch picture to fill, we can have about a 10, or for about 12 to 16 feet away from the screen, the projector will have to be. Oh, nice. Now, there are other lens packages that could change that. If you need a longer throw, maybe you need to shoot at 20 or 25 feet. They, you select a different lens package for that. Now, compared to, say, your Optoma, shooting to that same 92-inch screen size, the projector has to be in a much tighter range, uh, literally 10 to 12 feet away from the screen. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the major differences. Also, as I mentioned, increased light output with a projector like this as well. Now, the projector selection of inputs will cover most of your needs. Uh, this includes analog and digital connections. I stuck with HDMI for all of my testing. Now, when I loaded up SpectraCal's Calman software, driving all my test hardware, I got busy with some measurements. Right out of the box, the SIN 230's white balance, it showed okay consistency, uh, consistency across the grayscale range. That is, measuring at equal intervals from video black to peak white, uh, essentially it was, it was pretty good. Now, if a display doesn't mix red, blue, and green consistently when generating its grayscale picture, the portion of that picture, you will see discolorations that can affect portions of the picture. Usually, in, This usually occurs in the darkest parts of the picture or the brightest parts of the picture. Mm -hmm. Like, say, if it's getting too blue in the grayscale in the dark portion, right. you look into some shadow detail and things take on an overly blue characteristic that's unwanted. You want them to mix consistently from peak to dark. And this actually does provide effective controls for managing that. And I was able to dial this in quite nicely to get a nice linear response across the entire range. And also the display's gamma response. That's a, a little esoteric. Uh, this projector right out of the box, its response is basically the measured intensity of the light across a range of input voltages. And it's a nonlinear function that closely matches the response of the human eye. Essentially what I'm saying there is that an incorrect gamma response can produce a picture that looks washed out or it's missing or sacrificing darker bright detail. The SIN 230, right out of the box, produced a flatline gamma response at 2.2, if you're curious. That's what CRTs have historically mm -hmm. used. That's what the human eye is pretty close to. It turns out that uh, you know, we don't see increases in brightness linearly. And right. having that match, that curve function, that law function properly, is important to producing a picture that we see correctly. And the SIN 230's color gamut results showed me that the projector was almost spot on when displaying fully saturated red, blue, green, uh, cyan, magenta, and yellow colors. Essentially, you match this to the chart that defines HD color. Now, none of the levels were oversaturated. That would result in inaccurate depiction of HD video. You don't want, you don't want the colors to go off the scale because then it's, it, it looks cartoony, and it's, right. not, it's not being faithful to the original video source. It pops in an unfortunate way. Yes. Now, uh, however, I did notice that with green primary in particular, this is the only one that showed any kind of variance, it was slightly shifted toward yellow, which is not a terrible error but one you wish you could correct and higher end projectors typically include right. what they call a color management system that would allow me to adjust that kind of setting, but this one doesn't include that. So what's, I mean, what's the bottom line? We're talking about a, roughly a $6,500 projector? Totally. Uh, bottom line, it, it's one of the single finest single chip DLP projectors I've tested in terms of its ease of setup, out of the box performance, and the lens package, which there are several to choose from, and I give it a wholehearted thumbs up. But 
I would like to see someone do an affordable three-chip DLP design to match the efficiency and the motion performance right. of the three-chip systems you see the LCD and the liquid crystal and silicon, the LCOS folks doing. Now we have a JVC projector coming up. Yeah, and that's based, that's a three-chip system. The deal with single chip is because you're, you're shining all of that information through a spinning color wheel, you're only displaying one particular color channel at a time. It's sequential color systems. Right. That can decrease motion performance. So if you're a hardcore sports fan or, or action movie buff, single chip system might not be the way to go. If you've got the money, you might want to look into some of the three chip systems. But like you mentioned, we're going to be taking a look at JVCs. One other new 3D. My, my $650 projector will be smearing. <laughs> you know what? It, it's subjective, and right. there's also an issue with color breakup, too, which is an artifact you'll see with a single chip DLP system, where if you're looking at highly contrasted picture content, if you quickly dart your eyes left or right on the screen, you will see actually a rainbow artifact mm -hmm. in some cases. And if you're high, some people are more susceptible and more bothered by that than others. That's just one of those artifacts to keep aware of. However, in a, with the right setup, looking at the right screen and with the good content, this was just a delight. And uh, like I said, one of the best single chip projectors I've ever looked at. And before anybody freaks out about the price, uh, the last digital projection projector we looked at was somewhere in the neighborhood of $17,000. Yeah. And if you think about the fact that you're getting a 100, 120 inch screen out of this compared to, you know, $6,500, you know, plus a thousand or two for the screen is a heck of a lot less money than say sixty-five dollars or $75,000 for an 85 inch LCD or plasma. Totally. And digital projection and other companies like this that make DLP projectors mm -hmm. like to point out the longevity of the product. There's really, except for the spinning colorway, there's really nothing moving. And right. the DLPs are about as bulletproof as it gets. So you will eventually have to replace a lamp. Yes. And that's about it, really. So mm -hmm. consider long-term costs when factoring in a, an expensive home theater product like this. Hey, of course, it's time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of March 22nd, 2011. First up, Stand By Me, 25th Anniversary Edition. One of producer Serafina's favorite movies of all time, this 1986 film is based on a Stephen King short story and stars Will Wheaton, River Phoenix, Corey Feldman, Jerry O'Connell, and Kiefer Sutherland. This region free release comes in a 185 to 1 aspect ratio, and Blu-ray.com gives the video quality a 4 out of 5, saying the 1080p ABC transfer is solid, all things considered. The film's age is evident, and while the source is in relatively good shape, the picture simply lacks the polish, vibrancy, and absolute crispness of the best new releases. The audio track is available as both the DTS HD Master Audio 5.1 Lossless track and the original mono track. Extras include the director's audio commentary as well as an additional feature length picture in picture commentary retrospective with the director Rob Reiner and Will Wheaton and Corey Feldman. Also included is a 36 minute making of featurette and a Stand By Me music video. Next up, Riddick Blu ray collection. While both Pitch Black and The Chronicles of Riddick have been released on Blu-ray before, both separately and as a two-disc set, they're now releasing another version of the series, perhaps to stir up interest for the long-awaited third live-action film. Unlike previous releases, this collection includes the first HD release of Dark Fury, the 35-minute made-for-DVD animated film that segued the two live-action flicks. The collection comes in a VC1 codec across three 50-gigabyte discs, one for each film, there are extras on each disc, and while they are extensive, uh, there's nothing that's not included in the previous releases of each film. So while this does seem to be the ultimate collection for Riddick fans, if you're like us and would prefer to disown the sequel, you could probably give this one a pass. <laughs> also released this week, The Venture Brothers, The Complete Season 4. This Adult Swim cartoon is one of Roger and my favorites, and it's right up there with South Park and Family Guy. Season 4 was released on DVD in two parts, but the Blu-ray release gets the whole thing on one package. And not only one package, but one single disc. All 14 episodes are contained on a single 50 gigabyte disc with a VC1 codec and a Dolby True HD 5.1 soundtrack. Unfortunately, according to High Def Digest, cramming 387 minutes onto a single disc might not have been such a good idea. Quote, the problem isn't the sometimes thick, thick rings surrounding characters that make them appear glowing. It isn't the few random speckles or the cheap animation that has the Sphinx logo stationary and hover above some clothing articles instead of changing angles with them. The problem is artifacting and holy sh it's everywhere, unquote. So that's disappointing, but there are some decent extras, including an audio commentary for every episode, 28 minutes of deleted scenes, and a three minute Comic-Con promo and more. And as always, check out our show notes at techzilla.com or hdnation.tv for the rest of this week's Blu-ray releases. It's time to thank one of our sponsors, GoToAssistExpress. 
There are a variety of tools in the market that let you remotely work on another person's computer, but the only one I trust and rely on is GoToAssist Express, brought to you by Citrix. Why? Three reasons. Exceptional performance, it's easy to use, and security. No IT maintenance or updating is required, and it's so fast you'll be viewing your client's computers and troubleshooting in seconds. Plus, support clients' computers, even when they are away from their computers. Techzilla viewers can try GoToAssist Express free for 30 days. For the special offer, visit gotoassist.com slash techzilla. That's gotoassist.com slash techzilla for a free trial. Demo time. Yeah. Hey, in our last show, episode 200, a Techzilla fan named Mario asked about specific settings to use when encoding video for game consoles, and I suggested uh, giving that free application Handbrake another try. Now, I wanted to revisit Handbrake and show how to create your own digital copies of movies that you own. And essentially, I just want to also get into some of the app features and the uh, specifics for different encoding options that you want. So here's the main interface. I've got it loaded up on my notebook. And I just want to say, he was mentioning converting some DVDs. So I happen to have a DVD ripped on here. And essentially, you just go right up. This is a default install, by the way. I haven't changed anything. This is just right as it is installed, short of I did install, uh, I did install VLC for a, an activity or a preview mm -hmm. window and I pointed it to an output folder. That's the only thing I did. Basic stuff you have to do anyway. So on my computer, on my libraries, under video, I've got where I kept my ripped content. <clears throat> and here it is. Now, for DVD movies, this is actually ripped to a folder structure. You can select either the video TS folder or just the, the top level folder. In this case, I'm just going to select that. It doesn't matter. It will find that content, in particular the VOB files. Now, it's loaded in. Note that it's got the source resolution, 720 by 480. That's, that's DVD resolution. Now, this is a default setup for the normal profile that you see over here. Uh, if you were doing this to a specific device, like say your iPhone 4, boom, click that, and it will optimize it just as fine. However, I mentioned using these high profiles, and this is where if you want to play around with things, it's a good place to go. Uh, here, I wouldn't change a whole lot. Anamorphic, keeping it loose, and the modulus 16, all that is really doing is saying, you know what, let's keep everything to multiples of 16 so that mm -hmm. Scaling is easier to do in the MPEG-4 format. Right. If you want to tweak this, you can go ahead and change the width. Say you want to re make it half resolution. You can go ahead and change that down to 4, uh, 720, whatever the heck half of that is, 360 if you right. wanted to. However, I'm just going to leave that the way it is. Coming over to the video tab, this is where if you want to play around with quality settings, you can come in here. By default, you're going to see it constant quality at RF20. That's the default that works pretty well for all of basically every DVD and Blu-ray movie I've thrown at it. If you want to then instead, say, target a specific bitrate average, you can then select that, enter your bitrate information, average DVD bitrate. If it's a high-end DVD, it's going to be about 9,000 kbps. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely don't want to set it that high. Set it for something reasonable, maybe like 1,000 or 2,000. If you're unsure, just leave it at constant quality. Uh, again, also with target size, if you want to target a specific size, say, I want a one gigabyte file. Or, yeah, one gigabyte. I put in 1,000 megabytes and have it do that. Now, if you're going to use either of these two options, come back over here and do a two-pass encode on it and select Turbo First Pass. That means the first pass through the video, it's going to look at all the motion within the scenes of the movie mm -hmm. and distribute, it the, distribute the bit rate accordingly to where it needs more and doesn't need, or it can get away with you know, squeezing the bit right here compared to, say, an action sequence where you'd want more bit rate to keep, the, keep it clean and good looking. Nice. Audio-wise, if there's multiple audio tracks, you can see that, hey, in this case, it's going to do a down, it wants to do, by default, a down sample to uh, a two-track AAC file, which is pretty cool. I mean, that's typically what you're going to do. Or if you wanted to create, say, an MPEG, uh, an MPEG-4 file that contained the original 5.1 track, which is not very compatible with anything, mm -hmm. uh, you could select that as well. So those are the two options you have there. And you can also see, like, oh, maybe you want it to be MP3 instead. And likewise, I didn't mention this, but also the container file. If you want to make it an MKV instead of an MP MP4 file, that's where you make that selection as well. Uh, these options for large file size, web optimized, iPod, you can pretty much leave those unchecked. Uh, you'll know if you need to use those. It'll mention it if, if so. Now, I'll quickly just show, oh, once you get this set the way you want, including chapters and subtitles if you want to mess with that, honestly, once you pick like the high profile, it'll work just fine on just about any device that supports MPEG-4 video. Add it to the queue. That way it's not going to just immediately start working on you if you wanted to set up, say, additional encodes. Now, say I wanted to instead let me uh, select a different source. Let me just exit out of this, or can I just do a new? Yep, <laughs> let me just exit and reload it real quick and show you what the difference would be with a Blu-ray title. Now I want to create, say, my own video or my own digital copy, say, with a Blu-ray movie that I own. Again, I'm just going to go into my libraries, uh, wherever you store your video files. 
For BD Rips, uh, here's a particular movie I have, the full disc, blah, 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 blah. Let's see how smart this is, actually. There's a trick to this. No. Now, I'm actually just going to navigate directly to the folder structure just to show you real quick what file you would, uh, you know what, I don't have to do that. I'll take that back. Instead of source, go for video file instead of folder. That's what I should have said. Got it. So for video file then, now I'm going to go back to my libraries for video, the Blu-ray, here's the movie, the full disc there, the BDMV folder, and hey, it's empty. I forgot that I had deleted everything out of there. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> anyway, go into, that, go into the stream folder that's in the BDMV folder, and in there there'll be an M2TS file. The largest one is the main movie. Once that's in, it'll process it, and it's essentially the same process that I just showed you with the DVD video. There you and have it. That's it. So Wait, don't, don't fear. Do and you know fear. what? I found that the Apple TV 2 profile mm -hmm. is good for a 720p encode, or at least 1280 pixels wide. So even though it says Apple TV 2, it's a nice quality 720p encode. For MPEG 4 video. What and if you ADC want a 1080p encode? Pardon me? What if you want 1080p? Because that's better. I, you could go to the high profile, go back to the regular high profile and set it. If you didn't want to change the resolution of a Blu-ray movie and just leave it at 1080p, but maybe you wanted to squeeze the bit rate to maybe half, mm -hmm. I find that if you're going to compress 1080p video a lot, you should think about maybe dumping the resolution down. That will help with the overall quality. Instead of encoding at full 720 and 1080p, right. and you're, cut the bit rate in half, cut the resolution in half too, and you'll end up with a better quality file. Ian writes in, Tech Zilla crew, I'm in dire need of a bag that can safely hold two laptops. I'm tired of carting around two bags when traveling with my work and personal laptops. Thanks, Ian, in hot Atlanta, Georgia. Um, here's the thing, uh, notebook bags designed to carry two notebooks, just about impossible to find. Your best bet is to get a healthy sized bag, something that has some thickness to it, and get a padded laptop sleeve or envelope for the second laptop. Check out Spire USA's boot, that's a pretty nice one. And uh, slide that into your bag next to the other one. I've had good luck doing that with my Tad Gear dispatch bag, which I think is around here. Ooh. I've had a maximum of three <laughs> notebooks in this thing. That uh, does not surprise me. You're on your own for any back strain issues. I highly recommend backpacks as in two straps over each, one strap over each shoulder if you have a heavy load because the single strap bag with 30 pounds in it can get truly ugly on your lower spine. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Just saying. Pain. Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, West Host. West Host has been offering premium web hosting since 1998. We're talking about affordable plans to start at 19 cents a day, free US-based support, as in you'll understand the conversation on the phone, and they're on the phone 24-7. 365, well, phone, chat, and email. One click installs hundreds of apps, and they'll even transfer your website over to their hosting for free. Plus, you'll score a 60-day money-back guarantee and great server performance. How do you score this? Visit westhost.com slash techzilla. You'll get an exclusive 25% discount off web hosting, and you'll be supporting Techzilla. Westhost.com slash techzilla, people. Support the show by supporting our sponsors. Hey, responding to an earlier show about wireless data rates, Daryl sent us this email. I don't know if it's still available, but I got a T-Mobile data plan for $20 a month through Costco. I'm able to tether my, four, my touch 4G with no extra charge. I can also call over Wi-Fi without spending $150 bucks for a box like AT&T charges. I left my iPhone, and I'm thrilled. Signed, Daryl. There you have it. <laughs> done and done. By the way, our producer, Serafina, unlimited data through T-Mobile for 30 bucks a month, which includes tethering, so she can attach her notebook to her phone and truly? use the internets without spending a fortune. Does anyone offer truly unlimited anything anymore? Well, no. Kind of, a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully more than you need, but you never know. All I know is that's less expensive than what tethering would cost me with an iPhone. Just saying. Done deal. Or as Serafina was saying. <laughs> Time for a speed round. Michael commented on our Facebook page. So if you have an iPhone 4 with a personal hotspot set up, does it make any sense to buy an iPad 2 with 3G? What features or functionality would I be missing if I used an iPad 2 in this setup? Um, and one of the biggest issues with tethering your iPad to another device is making sure that both devices have excellent battery life. It's true. Uh, I've got a Sprint 4G overdrive modem, which has approximately two hours of battery life on a good day. Um, if sure. I'm... If you're leaving the phone plugged into your computer, just charging, right. or just plugged into the wall, I don't yeah. think it'd be a problem. But how often but, are you doing that? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting, right? The, the, it's one of the stranger features of the iPad 2 Wi-Fi is that it will actually access the GPS data from the iPhone 4 and possibly other devices. That's Definitely the iPhone cool. 4. So you can I did get not know you can, that. Yeah, I think that's great. That would have been great for the iPad 1, since that would have been <laughs> the iPhone 4 with that one. But um, you know. 
the, 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 the advantage to, to doing the 3G version and activating the 3G is you're done. You're not sitting here going, okay, click, click, I got my tethering, I got my this, and then this will always be connected to the internet, at least as long as there's 3G there. That's the primary advantage. It's self-contained. If you already have a, a you know, 3G or want to set up tethering uh, or use a 3G, 4G modem, go for it. Do the pay-as-you-go plans for the 3G service? Yeah. Or is that something you got to just subscribe to and no, get No, basically into? like you pay for a month and then you don't have Perfect. to renew it. So that's, that that's actually works. one of the shockingly nice things that at and did for that. Good deal. Quick for Geek Tweets, just watched this week's show. You talked about the cost of lamps, et cetera. DPI has a cost of ownership calculator. Why, I was just thinking about this. <laughs> Actually, it turns out that, that calculator is digital projections calculator mm -hmm. of the projector we just showed off. And it's, it's good. It goes through not only what you spent on the projector, how long you expect to own it, what your lamp module cost will be, and it tries to just factor in every little thing, how much you probably spent on the screen, get all the costs onto one spreadsheet, factor it out, and see what it's going to cost you over the life of the product. And that uh, it might help you convince your significant other that it's, it's a worthy <laughs> thing to buy rather than, you know, I don't know, sticker shock can be a, a hard sell sometimes. So <laughs> This is a nice used car. <laughs> or a projector. Or a projector. You want to read this one? Sure. Hey, Beats for the Mind tweets, in your latest episode, you reviewed an HTCP, a home theater PC, with a micro ATX MOBO. What is different in a micro ATX versus other motherboards? It's smaller. It is. And you typically don't have as many expansion slots. That's the main gist of it. You want, if you need multiple PCI Express slots for doing multiple graphics cards yeah. or multiple expansion cards, period, that's where you'll be most limited. I find otherwise, though, they're a wonderful platform to work on. That square, small motherboard fits in any standard case, even, even normal size cases. Desk the, drawers, small boxes. Totally. And uh, I find that you usually will have only, I want to say, four memory slots mm -hmm. as well. So you might have some memory limitations if you need lots of memory. But otherwise, I, I don't plan on ever going back to full-size ATX motherboards unless I, unless I have a really good reason to do it. And I haven't found one yet. So there you have it. <laughs> SR Huston tweets, hey at Techzilla, yes, it's a question even if it's a silly one, but is that an adipose over at Robert Heron slash at Veronica's shoulder? What's an adipose? Uh, it's a oh, uh, Doctor please, Who please, thing. Please Actually, don't. did someone steal it? Oh, it's the, the white thing? No, the little the white thing or the Adipose? Hello. Oh oh. He's huh. just I thought that was something completely different. Uh, Roger and Serafina are absolutely huge Doctor Who fans. Uh, I've never been able to get through an entire episode. Never seen an episode. Yeah. yeah. There's also a Cyberman behind us. What's a Cyberman? It's a sci-fi thing. I'll explain when you're older. Is that a Stormtrooper? Roger no. writes in, just watched the latest episode. <laughs> Nerd, you mentioned that Apple called Robert after he purchased the iPad 1.0 for his mother. What a good son. Aww. Anyhow, the comment brought to mind an article I saw that Apple was refunding iPad 1.0 purchases that were made two weeks prior to the release of the iPad 2. Maybe they were calling Robert to inform him he had a refund coming. Just thought you should know, and maybe Robert should call them back. Roger in Los Angeles. Yeah. I'll, I'll see if I still have that number, and if it actually can be called back. But I'm pretty sure I was a couple of weeks before that. I got it right before the Christmas holiday season. So let's all go to the lobby. I don't know why that's in my head now. I'm thinking of movie time. It's movie time. Where are those projectors and screens? And the speed round is over. Oh, for don't. everybody watching, we love your questions. So email us, techzell at revision3.com. Check out product reviews, how to's. You ask us, we'll do it, but we need those emails. So don't be shy. Send them into techzilla at revision3.com. Hey, even better, send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Yeah. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us the link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Techzilla. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching. I do appreciate it. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. <laughs> I'm taking this home. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> well, we're to fight. Probably going to show you. Uh-oh. I'm going to put it back. <laughs>
Because operating it. camera is not challenging enough, we put in a special trick floor here in Revision 3's main studio that allows you, by simply breathing at home, to cause our cameras to move. This region free release, oh, <laughs> sorry, God. Friends, they build, uh, uh, yeah, in three, two,